Hello everyone. Let's talk about how inflammation and brain inflammation can cause anxiety and how that works in the brain through the structure right here, the right amygdala. About a year ago, I did a video explaining how inflammation can cause depressed mood, and I'll link to that video at the end of this one. But people were asking if inflammation can cause depression, can it also cause anxiety? Very good question. The short answer is yes. Inflammation originating from the body or from the brain can prompt anxiety, and it can also exacerbate existing anxiety. So let me tell you how that works. Um, but first, uh, an important caveat. Not all anxiety is caused by inflammation, so you can't use anxiety as a sign of brain inflammation or systemic body-wide inflammation. In some cases, anxiety is driven by inflammation, and in other cases, it's not. It's driven by something else. Okay, so let's get into the brain here. Your amygdala, which I circled right here, it's responsible for monitoring information from your senses for signals of danger. So it monitors both conscious and unconscious signals. So it can even detect danger in things you're not even aware uh, are there. So it can even be not just things around you, it can be signals from inside your body. It can be chemical, like uh, blood sugar or leptin levels or carbon dioxide levels. And all of these signals are interpreted by the extended amygdala. And here's my quick, uh, very fast diagram of how this works in a very simplified way. The amygdala will take all of these messages from your brain and your body that say that there's some sort of danger or risk here, and then it takes in all the messages saying that everything is okay. And it averages those two. And as long as that average is below a distress threshold that I'm showing right here, you'll feel okay. But if you get too many danger signals and that pushes the average over the threshold, then a distress signal will be sent to regions like the hypothalamus and that's going to cause the anxiety or panic response. So avoiding anxiety means strengthening the everything is okay messages or decreasing the danger inputs to the amygdala. And inflammation is one source of inputs that gets you closer to hitting that distress threshold. So if you reduce inflammation, that should get you further from hitting that anxiety threshold. So for example, if I put you into my office and I say that you have to stay here by yourself for one hour and you can't leave the room, most people would probably be fine with that. But unconsciously, part of your brain has noted that your freedom has just been limited. Um, you probably won't notice that. It's not a big deal. Now, if I say you have to stay in my office for an hour and you have to sit in this chair without getting up for an hour, well, now your current state point has gotten even closer to that threshold. But again, I think most people would, wouldn't be overly bothered with having that restriction for, for an hour. But if we go a little bit further, and we say we're going to put a small box around you and the chair that will keep you contained in this spot for an hour and you can't really move or get out, many people, including me, will then reach their anxiety and panic threshold um, because they feel trapped. So that, there's nothing abnormal about that. Now, even if you personally could handle that, um, you could sit in that box for an hour and you wouldn't feel very anxious. Like if you can sit in an MRI scanner for an hour and be fine with it, that, that's very well true. But if we added something else to the mix, if we added inflammation to the mix, that might tip you over the edge of that threshold. So that is, that's what anxiety is really or that's why we have it. That's why we and our mammalian friends have the circuitry that give us that response because without fear and anxiety and panic, our species would probably not exist. It's really important for survival. So anxiety only becomes a problem when it's turned on all the time or it's being triggered by something that we don't want 
to trigger it. So we call that maladaptive. It's anxiety that's not doing us any good. Okay, so let's get back to the inflammation. In the inflammatory process, there's chemicals like interleukin-6 and interleukin-17 and tumor necrosis, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and they act on the amygdala to increase excitability. And these cytokines diminish the GABA activity, and GABA acts as a break on amygdala activity. So if you reduce GABA, you're going to increase the amygdala excitability, and that's going to make it more likely to send those distress signals. Um, I do want to note that this is another important caveat, I guess. Not everyone with systemic inflammation or brain inflammation has anxiety. In the experiments I do, I actually see depressed mood more often than I do anxiety. I believe it's, it seems that inflammatory anxiety is more likely in individuals who already have an issue dealing with anxiety and inflammation can be that final trigger to push it over the edge. And there's other studies that show that as well. I'll show you this figure right here. Um, this shows that higher levels of inflammation, which is measured with C-reactive protein, that's more associated with depression than it is anxiety. So there is an increase of depression and anxiety as your CRP gets closer to 10, which is quite high, but it's, it is more strongly related to depression than it is anxiety. So how do you know if you have inflammatory anxiety? Well, there's no easy way to know that. While there are some neuroimaging tools that allow us to see this, there unfortunately are no conventional medical tests to determine if a particular person's anxiety is due to inflammation. And so you can't go to your clinic and ask for it. So really the first thing to do is just find out if you have signs of systemic inflammation which is, again, inflammation throughout the body. And we hope that that, in most cases, serves as a good proxy for brain inflammation. And these are tests like C-reactive protein or erythrocyte sedimentation rate or interleukin-6. And you can check my previous videos for more information on those blood tests. Now, if there are signs of chronic inflammation, it is very reasonable to put a priority on reducing that inflammation. And there are several studies showing that even standard anti-inflammatories can reduce anxiety in some people. And there are so many tools that could help. There are pharmaceutical, I mentioned prescription and over-the-counter anti-inflammatories. There's things like low-dose naltrexone. There are botanical approaches like French maritime pine bark. There's interventional like vagus nerve stimulation or stellate ganglion block. There's dietary and a load of other anti-inflammatory protocols. In addition to that, labs are working on ways to directly alter the aberrant activity in the amygdala to try to calm down that anxiety using techniques like transcranial-focused uh, ultrasound. Now, I'm looking at mainly botanicals and pharmaceuticals that can cross the blood-brain barrier and address brain inflammation, and that should in turn help the anxiety. Treating brain inflammation is the whole point of this channel, so keep watching for the new information that comes out. And I've covered many treatment ideas in my previous videos, so do scan back through those and see if there's any ideas that you might be able to take to your doctor and try out. Uh, I, I do realize that anxiety is very uncomfortable and it is debilitating in many ways. And while I'm not an expert specifically on anxiety, I do hope that by addressing brain inflammation, we can reduce the number of people who have to deal with chronic anxiety disorders. And I wish all the researchers good luck in their work tackling anxiety from different angles and from different pathophysiologic mechanisms that they study. So that's it for today. Uh, I'm getting back up to speed after finishing my big grant applications, and I'm getting caught up on all the projects and initiatives that I've been working on. I do have some important, at least I think they're important announcements to make in the next couple of weeks about some new research uh, projects that I'm starting. So I hope you're able to keep watching, and I will be back soon.